Let us pray. Lord, let our relationship with you be our primary concern. Amen. Please be seated. Some of us are old enough to remember the song by Bob Dylan when he said, you got to serve somebody. Do you remember that? <laughs> In the gospel today, we listen to the words of Jesus who says, no slave can serve two masters, for the slave will either hate the one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. And Jesus tells a parable about a dishonest manager who's about to be fired by his rich boss. So the dishonest manager tries to curry favor with his master's debtors by remitting some of their debts. The parable of the dishonest manager makes us judge him. But before we judge him, we might ask why. Why did the dishonest manager suddenly help the poor people who were, who were beholden to his rich master? The poor people's debts were reduced by 20% to 50%, reduced probably to the original amount that was borrowed without hidden interest charges. Instead of taking further punitive action with, against him, the rich boss commends the dishonest manager for being a shrewd businessman. It's a surprising twist in the story. And parables often do this to us. They have a surprise twist. It's not an example story. It's a parable. And we're supposed to think about the twist, what it means. You expect the boss to be furious, but instead, he calls the dishonest manager shrewd and commends him. And so the story challenges us to understand what Jesus means when he says, be faithful with dishonest wealth. Be faithful with dishonest wealth. We have to ask ourselves why, but I think the key is seeing that the dishonest manager is in a desperate situation. He's about to be fired, and he realizes that forgiving people their debts will build relationships with them once he's out of this powerful position. You know, Jesus spent a lot of time with tax collectors and sinners. He didn't come to save the, the pure, the righteous. He came, uh, you know, just as a physician comes to heal the sick. And these tax collectors and sinners are a lot like us. They're imperfect people who are trying to get it right, some with their backs against the wall. And he takes into account all people, inviting us to look at our own life stories and also to try to understand the stories of others. We might try to forget that most of us have made horrible decisions in our lives and that we have all fallen short of the glory of God. In this story, Jesus is telling us that relationships are more important than money and should be served by money rather than the other way around. Forgiving the debts of others is one of the most compassionate things we can do. And Jesus teaches us this consistently in the Gospels. In the Lord's Prayer, he says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. It is this idea of jubilee that's found in the Hebrew scripture of forgiving the debts of others forgiveness over and over and over again. And just as you can't walk east and west at the same time, you cannot serve God and money at the same time. Another way of saying that is you cannot be devoted to both God and devoted to money. You've got to choose. Yet money constantly exerts its pull on us, much like a great magnet always threatening us to pull us away from God. And it's really tempting to be dishonest in small things, which leads to dishonesty in big things. And I wonder, how does money exert a pull over you? Wrong attitudes about money can really lead to spiritual ruin because it means putting the, the power of money over the power of God. And that's, that's not right. God is the all-powerful one. Nevertheless, it is possible to use money in Christ-like ways. Our stewardship team met this week, and, and we talk about this a lot. Honesty in little things, faithfulness in little things. 
you know, using money in Christ-like ways means making material sacrifices on behalf of someone else or on behalf of a good cause, such as giving up my time to listen to someone, what you have to say. That's a sacrifice in a sense. Or giving up a portion of my financial means so that you don't have to suffer. Underlying these actions is a faith that God is good and that there is an infinitude of good to be shared. We can expand ourselves in and through Christ to be more giving, to be more loving towards others. If we have a desire to change our ways, to be more generous, our faith can help us. We can get out of the darkness of our lives because we have this incredible faith that says you don't have to end where you started. There is purpose in each of us waiting to be discovered, dying to be discovered, and our God is with us while we're trying to figure it out. Little by little, we find our way. We do the best we have with what we, what we, we know until we know better. And when we know better, as they say, we can do better. Can you imagine a God who recognizes and celebrates the potential you have, even when you're failing miserably? A God who can help us transition from dishonesty to honesty. This is our God. You have to serve somebody. And you can't serve both God and wealth. So my brothers and sisters, choose God to love and to serve. Amen.